Tom Clark's main event is a Boink Studios production. Follow us on Twitter at Boink Studios and check out our Facebook page where you can see all of our projects, past, present, and future. And now, on with the show. This is Daddy's show. Step off. <laughs> Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to the program, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tom Clark, and you are listening to Tom Clark's Main Event. This is episode number 63 of the podcast, and if you're joining us today for the very first time, we'll bid you welcome. If you're coming back for a repeat visit, we say, hey, thanks for checking back in with us. And to all those involved, we'll extend to you the customary laurel and a hearty handshake. Thanks for listening. Thanks for reading. Thanks for supporting. And hey, thanks for always being there, Doc. Episode number six. I'm choked up already. Episode number 63. For those of you who have ever wondered, the introduction is done every single time I record. I don't have it pre-recorded and then I, you know, edit it in with the audio later. I actually record it every single time. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so you can imagine, uh, of course, what what a nightmare it was in the very beginning when I first started this show to remember everything, <laughs> the entire introduction, which has been tweaked as time has gone on, of course. I didn't have all this from the very beginning. I didn't add in the Blazing Saddles reference till a little bit later on. That's, of course, the uh, the Laurel and Hardy handshake. So, anyway... Just I thought I'd give you some some background on that. Some that's some deep cuts from Tom Clark's main event. So where were we? Oh yes, pro wrestling. So hey, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. I'm Tom. Uh, thanks for coming back, dude. We do appreciate your business as always. Glad you are with us. Hope everything's going well with you and yours. Everything's going splendidly with yours truly. Couldn't be happier. Um, everything is uh, copacetic, as they say. Especially when you get to cover the the wide, wonderful world of WWE. And I defy you to say that three times really fast. Don't think you can do it. Dude, I can't do it. So, uh, yeah, what's going on, man? I know that you've been watching the product, Yes. Pretty big uh, events recently, depending upon when you decided to listen to this particular episode. Um, But yeah, some really big stuff happening as of late. And we're going to cover a lot of that here today. With the emphasis being on something very important that happened on a recent edition of Monday Night Raw. That's right, folks. WWE's flagship program has done it again. They have once again uh, turned the wrestling world upside down with something that happened. And we're going to talk about that. But why don't we just go ahead, get this ball rolling, shall we? And let's go ahead and cover the main event. The main event this time around is the return of Goldberg. That's the event we're talking about, by the way, the Monday Night Raw event, in case you didn't know. But, uh, I, I, it's, it, dude, um, <laughs> speechless. Speechless. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, you need to go back and watch this because it was, um, it was, I'm, you know, I've been trying to find the right word for this. I wrote a column immediately after, so emotions were running pretty high. Uh, opinions were coming out pretty quickly. I use words like epic and important and, um, uh, you know, uh, big time for WWE, and it is. Uh, here's the funny part. A lot of critics, a lot of haters out there, and you know who you are, did nothing but blast this idea from day one. They said, it's a terrible idea. I hate Goldberg. Always hate him. He's overhyped. Uh, he's not good. He's terrible. Um, WCW is dead. Why doesn't he just stay where he's at, stay retired? I heard all of that. I read all that. I debated people on that very topic. And I was one of the guys 
who defended Goldberg during his WCW run. I defended him when he came to WWE, and I've been, been defending him for years. Let's get something straight right now. Bill Goldberg is a pro, uh, and he doesn't need me defending him from anybody or anything. Let's get that much out in the open right now. Um, in case you don't know who Goldberg is, or you uh, you haven't followed his career all that much, Goldberg's in pretty good shape, and he's a tough guy, and he can fight his own battles. He certainly doesn't need me or any other writer out there to do the talking for him. But I often found myself, even to this very day, taking the position that Goldberg is not the, you know, the the selfish talent, selfish monster, the guy that just came in and took what he wanted and got out, as a lot of people said at the time. I just, I never have gotten that vibe about him. And if anyone has bothered to take the the time to, you know, listen to his interview since he did get out of the business, I think you will find that it's not the guy that everyone thought it was. The Goldberg that we saw on the October 17th edition of Monday Night Raw, which he came back after 12 years absence from the business, absence from WWE, a lot of people said, well, it's a different Goldberg. Not the same guy that left. Oh, it's a different guy. It's it's a it's not the same Goldberg. Oh, it's it's uh, he was humbled. He was a human. He was a. Here's here's my problem. And yes, I again I probably on Bleach Report I was I don't think I was the first Goldberg returns column that that broke after Raw went off the air. But I was probably in the top the top two to three probably. Um, Goldberg's return was humbling. You could tell by looking at him that he was truly taken aback from the response of the crowd. They were in Denver, Colorado. I don't know that I even actually believed he was going to get the response that he that he got. I was happy he did. I was very glad to see he did. Made me feel good. Made me feel good as a longtime fan, as someone who respects the boys apart from their gimmicks, apart from being in, uh, you know, characters and all that stuff. I have a lot of respect for these guys and gals who get in the ring and, and you know, essentially put their lives on the line to to have fun, to tell stories in the ring and to tell stories with their bodies. That's, you know, it, it it's all part and parcel of making you smile, of giving you someone to love, of giving you someone to hate, of giving you something to talk about when you go to work the next day, giving you something to look forward to when the pay-per-view comes up this you know, the next following Sunday or whatever it is. And that's their job. And a lot of them do amazingly well at it. Some do better than others. But every time one of these folks gets in the ring, for you and me, they are leaving their family behind. They're putting their physical well-being on the line and at stake to entertain. That's what they do. I have mad respect for anyone that's ever climbed into a professional wrestling ring and wanted to do it the right way. And that's why I have a lot of respect for the superstars in WWE locker room. And that's why I have a lot of respect for Goldberg. I did before, I do now, and I will tomorrow. And here's the thing, okay? All these people claiming that, oh, well, Goldberg's this is a different Goldberg. Dude, how do you know that? Isn't that funny? This is coming from a bunch of people who, they've never met the guy. They don't know him. The only Goldberg that they know is what they've seen on TV. Or it's the Goldberg that they think exists, who's this selfish, you know, ex-football player who was given everything way too fast in WCW. He didn't deserve it then. He doesn't deserve the spotlight now. For all those people out there who hated on this guy for years, well, this is a different Goldberg. Even I respect him. Shut up. You think he needs it? Think he wants it? You think Goldberg came out to change hearts and minds on Raw? Goldberg was flattered. He was flattered. And in my humble opinion, in my humble opinion, I believe, Goldberg was told, here's the key talking points. But other than that, roll with it. And I believe that's exactly what he did. He rolled with it. I think that he was knocked out by the emotion of the moment. I think that he was really flattered by it. I think that he was thrown off a little bit by how much he got. I mean, dude, the guy had tears in his eyes. It was a massive moment for him. I would say, and just my opinion, 
one of the top ten moments of Raw uh, in recent years. I can't. I don't know of anything that could get any bigger than that in terms of raw human emotion. This was a guy that, again, all of his critics who has nothing or have nothing but terrible things to say about him. This flies directly in the face of everything any critics ever said about him because we all like to praise the talent for, and especially the guys that came up like Sean and Triple H and, you know, well, Rick was my idol and, and Flair was the man and I want to be this, want to be that. When those guys get emotional, oh, look at him. He's, oh, what a great guy. I mean, we love him so much. He's so dedicated to the business. When Goldberg teared up, people could have turned, but they saw him and they understood this is not an act. Wow, this guy's humble. I can't believe it. Dude, again, how do you know? <laughs> you just assume we're all fans. I won't use the M word. I won't soapbox about it this time, I assure you. But we're all fans. And we we all think we know a lot. Trust me. And the problem with that that assumption is that it is indeed an assumption. Because when we look at these guys, we see character. No matter how smart we think we are, no matter how edu how educated we believe that we've become, we see character. You can't look at a wrestler without seeing character. Good luck. Good luck. Because the best guys, the best entertainers, the best showmen in the history of the business are so good with their gimmick, they've incorporated it into who they are. Or their gimmick is an extension of who they are. So much so to the point that you cannot differentiate between the two. Now, I'm not talking about Oh, Dusty was Dusty, and Austin is really Austin, and Rock is really Rock. I'm not talking about it has to be flamboyant and over the top. I'm talking about uh, it, it has to be to the point where, you know, you look at it and you, you really firmly believe that they're the same person. And here's the thing. You have to be able to look past the gimmick. You have to be able to look at a talent and understand a few very key important things, a few very important key principles, I should say, about any man or woman that steps into a pro wrestling ring. Number one, they want to be there. No one's taught them into it. <laughs> Can you imagine having your arm twisted and being taught into becoming a professional wrestler? Now, sometimes your motivations for coming back are, might be against what you want, and maybe you need a payday. And if you do, if you if you do need a payday, hey, that's life. That's how it is. No sense in hating a guy for that. You know, a lot of people get mad when they see a veteran come back and say, oh, he needs a payday. So what? So what? If the company's willing to pay him, let him have his payday. Who cares? If he does his job, he does it right, does everything in his power to, to contribute, then why not let the guy have a payday? See what I'm saying? But the motivations, again, it, it, it could be anything, all right? But we always think that we like, we always like to think that we know. We don't always know. The, the arrogance of pro wrestling fans at times boggles the mind. <laughs> What's the saying? Um, uh, confuses the eye and confounds the understanding, I believe. It's the same. It's, it's, it, it's never been more apropos than it is here. And it, it's just amazing to me that suddenly we, we view Goldberg in a whole different light. Now, this is good for him. This is extremely good for him. You know why, right? Because if this match with he and Brock Lesnar takes place at Survivor Series, Survivor Series is taking place in Canada. And yes, that's where Brock Lesnar currently calls home. It's hard to outpop Brock Lesnar. Ask anybody on the roster, they'll tell you that. It's, it's very hard to outpop him. It's not impossible, but it's extremely hard. You, it depends on who you are and is... I, mean, I don't. I don't know who could do it right now. Who could do it? Who could do it? Who is Seth Rollins? Probably is over enough. I mean, you got to talk about you know hardcore over like a baby, uh, hardcore over like a baby face, biggest baby face right now. He and Ambrose maybe can get if they were in the ring on the mic against Goldberg or Heyman at the same time. Then yeah, I get out pop him. We're talking about a guy that has been in the business for twelve years. Who again, I hate to keep talking about his critics and giving these idiots publicity, but here it goes. His critics said that he shouldn't have been there to begin with in 2004. He shouldn't be there now. Shouldn't come back. It's payday. It's this, that, and the other thing. So for Goldberg's critics, it becomes, well, who does he think he is after 12 years? The only reason WWE's bringing him back is because 
you know, they, they booked Brock to the moon and this is all they got left because he's run through all the competition. And yes, I did write that column. Go read it because it's got valid points. And I'm not right about everything, but I'm right about everything in that column. I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying, man. Hey, give me a break, dude. It's late. I'm just saying. I'm like kind of sleep deprived right now. But hey, man, we're still trying to make it entertaining, right? But yeah, uh, those same critics that said he has no business being there. Those same cr critics that said, well, he needs to stay out you know, no matter what and all that other garbage. Well, the way he... I don't want to say broke down, but the way he got emotional on Raw the other night, dude, that will help his cause. Because again, Survivor Series is happening in Canada. It's hard to outpop Brock Lesnar, as we said. Goldberg may not outpop him, but I believe, I believe that he may have done a lot of good for his cause. That people who might have been on the fence about him, that might have looked at him and said, well, you know, he's this, he's that. Maybe they might be in his corner now. And here's why. Despite how popular Brock is for being the beast incarnate, despite how popular he is for being the unstoppable juggernaut, and he is all of these things and a lot more. Don't misunderstand me. When's the last time he talked about Sable, his wife, on the air? When's the last time he talked about wanting to have kids or loving kids? When's the last time he talked about being a hero to people? When's the last time he talked about being a role model? When's the last time he talked about we need more heroes? When's the last time he talked about, you know, wanting to give back? When's the last time Brock Lesnar or his advocate Heyman said anything of the, of the like? They haven't. Do you understand? You see where I'm going with this? If you put the narrative of both guys beside each other at the same time and really examine both, then you begin to see the major differences between the two. That's what I'm saying here. It's a big deal. It's a major deal. And it's very subtle. And you may not see it happening right now. You may not even hear many writers or read about many writers uh, going into detail about this, but you're hearing it here. And this is my take on it, okay? I think that he did extremely well for his cause. Because now Goldberg is no longer... You know, the, the heartless monster, former football player that couldn't hack it in the NFL. And he came in and got a payday from WCW, which he didn't deserve. And a run in WWE, which, you know, it should have ended with Brock pinning him. Because let's face it, Goldberg was never good to begin with. He never should have beat Hunter for that title. He never got over. He was a fish out of water. You know, he was a big fish in a in an even bigger pond, as it were. And had no business being there, and yada, yada, yada. And he, you know, he hurt guys in the ring. And I'm not making a lot of that part, by the way. Things happen. I'm just saying. But all of that stuff that's negative about Brock that's ever been said, or excuse me, about Goldberg that's ever been said about Goldberg, all that stuff wrapped up, in, wrapped up into one, I think. All of that stuff that you have heard and that maybe you believed as well is going to start changing to the notion that, dude, Goldberg really does love this business. He takes being a role model very seriously. He wants to wrestle in front of his wife and his son because they've never seen him work before. And he wants to go out with a bang. And Goldberg, or excuse me, Brock uh, challenges manhood. And Goldberg's not going to back down. I got respect for a guy that won't back down. You know what? Goldberg's all right in my book. Sit there and tell me that that's not the conversation being had as we speak. Because I know it is. Because... Pro wrestling is about nuances. It's it's about the very subtle moments when you think you know everything there is to know. You're so smart. But then an idea is put forth, whether it's by a writer or by a wrestler or by a manager or by the McMahons or by someone. And a lot of times, 99% of the time, it's through the format of a promo. And you listen to a promo and you said, Wow, dude, he really touched me. That's what Goldberg did on Raw. That's what he did. He did amazingly well at it. And I believe that, yes, indeed, he has changed minds. And this will help him in the long run. Because now, you know, family guy coming back for the sake of his son, coming back for the sake of his fans, who... You know, Goldberg does a lot of work for charity. He does a lot of work for Make-A-Wish, like a lot of the boys do. God bless him for it. 
he does a lot as well. And he has over the years since leaving the business. You don't have to be a pro wrestler to do make a wish, by the way. I mean, it's, it's about giving back to these kids and showing them that, you know, I'm going to be the, the best guy I possibly can be, if for nothing else, but uh, if only for your sake. Because I know you're looking up to me. That's big. That's massive. John Cena should be commended for that. I mean, I'm not pulling any punches. But so should Goldberg. A lot of guys do. Goldberg made the comment on Steve Austin's podcast. It was important to him that, you know, when he's in an airport exhausted, that there's there's people coming up, kids coming up on autographs, that he doesn't act like a jerk to him. That he needs to be Goldberg. He doesn't need to be Bill. He needs to be Goldberg. The Goldberg that they that their dads grew up watching or that their dads used to watch. Now the kids know and their dad's like, look, come on, you got to get an autograph from Bill because he's awesome. See what I'm saying? He's very aware of who he is. So now you take that new dynamic of the supposed reborn Goldberg, who, in my opinion, more than likely was the same guy he was when he was there to begin with, but no one wanted to see it. You see where I'm going with that one? So you take this guy as a family man. Again, he came back for all the right reasons. He doesn't need the payday. He's done very well for himself. He's been smart with his money from everything I've ever read about him interviews, columns, and, and, and from people who would know, Bill's always been very smart, okay? So he's done very well for himself, and that's the thing you need to do. Because the, the problem with a lot of pro wrestlers is they're not smart with their money. That's the, that's the case with any, you know, pro athlete. There's Not all these guys know how to handle their money correctly, so apparently Bill does, and good on him. So he didn't need the payday. So now you take all of that, all that new perspective on Bill Goldberg, match it up against the showman against the prize fighter against the annihilator um the hitman the headhunter uh you know the guy that um uh i mean if you really think about it this whole thing played out like a movie which is exactly what WB wants it's what Vincent Mann wants he's i mean the the famous quote from Vince is that we make movies here at WB we're not a wrestling company and I mean, I'm sure he still believes that. So at its best, yeah, WWE is movie making. But if you really think about this, this is what this is. This is, you know, the entitled performer that's maybe been pampered the whole time. That's run through everybody. That's in this for the money. He doesn't care about the business. He doesn't care about the heart of the business, the soul of the business. That all he wants is to be, you know, the guy that gets paid. You know, that's all he wants. As long as the cash is right, as long as a big bag of money for him, that's all he cares about. And that's what Brock Lesnar has always kind of been known to be. And that's what he's being, been portrayed as for the past several years since he came back in 2012. I mean, that's that's a big deal, man. That's a really big deal. Like, that's that's sort of how, uh, that's how, uh, that's how he's seen. The words prize fighter mean nothing in regards to Kevin Owens, all due respect. They mean everything in regards to Brock Lesnar. He is the prize fighter, for sure. That's what he's there for. You know, fight the big fight in the main event, take the big fat check at the end of the night, and then he's gone again for another three months or whatever it is. And you got this guy versus the guy that's the family man. He's coming back for the right reasons, you know, etc. I mean, again, it's like a movie. It's like, you know, Lightning Boy Martone in the head cutting duel against Jack Butler in the finale of Crossroads. If you don't know your movies, go check that out. It's freaking awesome. Steve Vai is Jack Butler. Are you kidding me? I mean, you could you could say this is, you know, Ivan Drago and Rocky, I guess, if you want to, and all other stuff. But, you know, basically, you've got two guys who are very good at what they do, but who have different motivations for doing it to begin with. And one guy is basically doing it for the right reasons. The other guy's doing it for the vanity of it, for the the thrill of hurting people. And it's like... Dude, this is going to be a storyline that will sell itself, okay? And it will not need a lot of work to make it happen either. It won't. WWE doesn't need to ever book this. This is very simple booking. And it's going to get done on the backs of Goldberg and Brock Lesnar both. Um, will there be an opportunity to pull Bill's wife and son into this? I think if all parties involved are okay with it and no physical harm comes to either one of them, why not have Heyman maybe get in her face one night or Brock maybe pat the kid on the head one night when he's, you know, walking by the barrier, by the barricade and they're in the front row again. 
I'm not saying, you know, pull a David Flair on him where he, he assaults him in the bathroom, that kind of thing. Nothing like that needs to happen. And I, I'm sure that Goldberg doesn't want that kind of thing to happen either. But a simple pat on the head. And they talk about it beforehand. And Brock shakes his hand and meets the kid and, his, and, Brock's, or, and Bill's wife and everything. And says, well, all I'm, I'm going to do is pat you on the head. No worries. And as long as they trust him and as long as everything goes well, then why not? You see what I'm saying? Dude, the crowd would pop off of that. And you talk about lighting a fire on Bill Goldberg, the likes of which you haven't seen in years. Dude, I mean, I'm sitting here. I got chills thinking about it. This, again, don't overbook this. This is going to be an easy story to tell. And it's basically beginning to tell itself as we speak. Because with one promo, people have already started talking. They're going to put two and two together. They're they're gonna they're gonna make this stuff work, and they're gonna decide for themselves what this story should be, and that's what's happening in front of your very eyes. I'm not the only guy that's putting two and two together here. You have probably have as well. Other people have as well. So by the time you get to hear Brock's response, you're already gonna have this preconceived idea in your head that you know Paul's gonna come out and say, "Look, you know this is about the money, and the payday is gonna be there. Thank you." Goldberg for getting our paycheck so big for my client. And that stuff works on certain levels. But when you start messing with a man's family, you change the entire dynamic of the entire storyline. And that is definitely going to happen here. One storyline that they, on, on a side note, but in relation to this actually, when Bray showed the picture of Roman and his daughter, and then they did not pursue it. Now, am I suggesting that we go this route every time? Absolutely not. Um, it, but it shouldn't be also used in the hands of the wrong heel. Bray Wyatt is is absolutely the best heel to use this for. So is Brock Lesnar. Because you're talking about devious, dangerous, despicable. The three D's for any heel out there. Dangerous, devious, and despicable. And the three D's mean everything, okay? And that's what it is. You can add, you can, well, yeah, no, that's that's what I got for you. But, dude, tell me two other heels that those apply to more than Bray and Brock Lesnar. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's, it just boggles the mind that they didn't pursue this with Roman. Roman could have got over in such a great way. Because the Roman Reigns that you see on TV is not necessarily the Roman Reigns, the man. And again, we're talking about breaking down Goldberg and to his core essence and showing you the man behind the myth and the legend. Well, they've not really done that for Roman. And there's always talk, there's always ideas, there's always speculation by fans and writers and critics and lovers and supporters and haters alike about what should be done with Roman Reigns. In my humble opinion, um, a lot of the a lot of that has sailed. The ship has sailed on him in some ways because after continued efforts to get him over have failed, that he needs to go back to the drawing board, but they yet they refuse to do it. They will not do it. But using his daughter in a storyline in which Bray Wyatt is, you know, he's evil. He's going somewhere he shouldn't go. That should have brought out an amazing intensity. An amazing monster reaction out of Roman Reigns that would have turned WWE's fans upside down. It did not happen because WWE did not go that route. If I were WWE, I would go that route this that route this time with Goldberg. And again, you you have planted the seed. Goldberg has planted the seed. Now WWE needs only to water it. Okay, but here's the key: like we said, don't ever do it. Don't soak it. If it calls for, you know, six ounces of water, don't give it 12. Do you see what I'm saying? That's important. That's important to not ever do it. It's important to take your time. It's important to be smart about it. It's important to let this thing grow and let it happen organically. And again, don't make this too hard. Roman Reigns is a good example of what could happen when you add too much to it, when you force it. And I know the word force has been used in regards to Roman for the better part of a year, two years now. But it's always going to be used because people cannot forget 
how WWE forced that dude on to fans and how fans didn't want anything to do with it. How the possibility was there that it would work, but when someone is force-fed something that they don't want to eat, they're going to spit it back up. Try, for, try feeding a baby who's already full. I'll tell you from experience, that food's going to come back. Or he's going to shake his head no to get away from the spoon. And that's what fans did with Roman Reigns. And guess what? They're still doing it. It just, I'm smiling because I'm just, it, I've done podcasts and I've written columns and I've done shows and I've had debates and I've had conversations and I've had arguments. And sometimes I'm right. A lot of times maybe I'm not right. But at the end of the day, WWE had a great opportunity with a guy that had a blank canvas after the shield and they blew it. And the the great thing with Goldberg in in contrast here, Goldberg already has success. He's already been over. Goldberg was the top guy in WCW for a while. He was. You had to say he was. He was the top draw, in my opinion. Goldberg is one of those guys that you pay to see. And people compared him to Austin because of the, the physical similarities. But I'm not comparing those two guys for that reason, but for the reason of, let's say you have, you know, uh, let, let's throw it out there. Let's say you have, and, and what WCW had, you had an aging Hulk Hogan. You had Holland Nash, who looked great, but, you know, that sort of re, you know outcast from, from WWE. WWE. You had NWO that was filled with former WWE stars. And fans, again, you know, maybe not the smartest guys in the world fans sometimes were not. That's true. But at our, at our, at our core, we're pretty smart when it comes to why the companies do what they do. We knew that WCW was using these guys because they got over in WWE and because they had name recognition, because WCW needed to bolster its talent roster. We get it. But after seeing the NWO jump everyone in the locker room every week for like a month straight, and then two months, and then three months, and then four months, okay, this is getting kind of old. Goldberg, however, was something new, fresh different, unique, punishing, uh, a force of nature, you know, um, one of those things that, that that's reserved for, and I, I've heard Jim Ross made this comparison to Andre the Giant, because Goldberg is an attraction. He's not going to deliver what Daniel Bryan could deliver in the ring. He's not going to be, you know, the, the punisher in the ring that Arn Anderson was, the, 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 the genius in the ring, um, and 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 the technician that uh, that Dean Malenko was. He's not going to be that guy. That's not who he is. He is an attraction. He's a name. He brings fans to the table because of his intensity. Because it's like you know going to see the monster unleashed, and that's what he is. I think that he is what I think Goldberg is. What WWE always booked Batista as, and it never worked, especially when he came back the last time. It worked for a while because Batista had some mystery around him. Fans didn't know a whole lot about his actual personality. But when he came back the last time around and snapped and went off on fans, when he should have just been, you know, humbled like Goldberg was, when he came back at the Rumble, won the Rumble, and then after the Rumble that year, he flipped off fans after the show went off the air. And I'm like, he did what? Doesn't he know he's supposed to be a baby face, you know? And I, I love me some Batista and Guardians. I do. I think the dude has a whole other career opening up for him. And I think he's talented in ways that people never knew. But at the time, I'm like, this guy's out of his freaking gourd, man. Why didn't he just pick up the mic even after the show had gone off the air? He heard the booze. Why didn't he go back down to the ring? You know, tell whoever's got to tell on the way down. Tell an agent backstage, I'm going back out there. Go back out in the ring. Pick the mic up and say, look. I know you guys are hating on me right now. I know I'm not the one you wanted to see win, but I have to tell you, from the bottom of my heart, I, I appreciate the chance to perform in front of you again. I've missed this, and I don't know how long this road will take me or where it's going to take me or what's going to happen in the future, but every time I get to step in this ring, I consider it an honor and a privilege and a pleasure. And whether you love me or hate me, thank you very much. I do really appreciate it. Lay the mic down, do a bow. He would have got a pop. He would have got a pop. Go outside after he said that. Go around the ring. Shake hands. Give some high fives. Go up on the ramp. Turn around. 
do a bow and do the hands in the prayer motion and look to the fan and say, thank you. Be humble. They could have salvaged the baby face run. Maybe he would have had to turn heel again because of Daniel, and that's great. But it wouldn't have been so forced. It wouldn't have been him losing his mind. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so ticked off about fans. It sucks. <laughs> what? Oh, I mean, we don't to this day really know if they kind of told him to do that. Hey, if the crowd turns on you today, just do what you got to do, man. Or if he did it on his own or whatever it was. But in my opinion, the whole thing could have been saved. And I think that's what that's what they they booked they booked Batista like the monster and like the animal was the, what they called him right the animal unleashed but that's what Goldberg is it kind of felt like a character for Dave doesn't feel like a character for Bill Bill feels like he has a switch especially now if you saw him outside of the ring during interviews and stuff over the years you could see that he has a switch obviously but and I mean Austin is basically Austin but only calm down when he's not in the ring. See what I'm saying? But Goldberg has a switch. And once the switch is flipped, he's all man. He's all, and he's like a big piece of steel. And he's intense. He is uh, carnage unlimited, as Gordon Sully once said of, of the Road Warriors. And that's what it is. And I think that now that that point has come across, I think that he has a much easier time of getting over than he ever did before. Because let's face it, his run in 2004 was not good. It was not even, it just wasn't fun. I'm, I'm thinking, there's some highlights from that time. You could tell that he was really putting his heart into it. But I think toward the end, you could see that he was really getting tired. And he said things in the past, you know, he, he made the comment that um, his last night on Raw that, you know, he saw things that just he just shook his head at, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and things that he didn't really get very vocal about, but he's just like, why are we doing this kind of stuff? You know what I mean? So a lot of things bothered him. But you know what? And I, I give the guy credit. And again, I, I guess this just sounds like nothing but a fan talking. But I'm trying to give you the, the basics here of what I know to be true, what I feel to be true. The guy didn't, you know, run, give every dirt sheet interview he could when he left to my knowledge, okay? He didn't write a scathing tell-all book, you know, talking about, oh, what a terrible company WWE is, and oh, I hate them, and this, that, and the other. He never did that. He didn't come out and blast the company. He has, he gave some interviews. He's not, he's, he's not a saint. I mean, he's not perfect. He may have said things at times that he, you know, might could have took back or whatever, but I don't recall there being the kind of backlash from him that we got from Brock when Brock got out the first time. Okay. So I don't recall there being that. And I don't recall there being a backlash against him for stuff he may or may not have said or the way he looked during an interview, an attitude, a sideways glance or whatever it is. Because that's not really him. He has no reason to bash a company that it just didn't work out in. I mean, he could, but what would be the real reason for that? Where, where's the future in that? What's... What's the good part of bashing WWE when you're gone? What good has that done for you or for that company or anybody involved? Has it helped you in any way? If the answer is no, then why are you doing it? Just as a man, why are you doing it? So Bill had opportunities to burn that company up, and then he chose not to because he wanted to get on with his life. He got married, had a kid. He's really, really into muscle cars. I have... One, I love muscle cars, by the way. 66 Mustang is my baby. It's my, that's my dream. So one day, before I shuffle off this mortal coil, perhaps, I will own a pony. <laughs> Ask Santa for a pony, Tom. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll try that one year. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, just Bill doesn't have that personality. He doesn't have that reputation. And when you do not have the reputation of having, having sour grapes you get accepted back in a heck of a lot quicker. And fans trust you a lot faster. doesn't mean they won't eventually, but they trust you from the jump. And I think Goldberg has a crowd on his side. Now, going all the way back to what I said previously, he's going to need the crowd on his side for Survivor Series if that's when the match happens, and I assume it will. 
because again, it's going to happen in Canada, and that's where Brock currently calls home. So he's going to have the crown on his side, I would assume. Um, and I, I think it would be crazy to assume that he will not have the crown on his side. So, with that being said, how much of the crowd will Bill actually have? Well, it's not over yet. You have to hope that week two is just as good as week one of this new feud. I'm not going to call it a rivalry. I'm going to call it a feud. Okay. Um, Bill fired, well, not the first shot. Paul fired the first shot when he came out and challenged Bill on, on Brock's behalf. Second shot was fired when Goldberg came back. The third shot is going to be when Brock answers. I mean, let's get this straight. You made the challenge. The guy accepted. Now you have to answer. I mean, here's the thing. Um, if it's me, hands off. They did. They have no business touching each other. Okay. They need to come face to face before Survivor Series gets here. And they got time for that. It's November. Th- 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 I going to say 30th, but that's, that doesn't sound right. Uh, it's soon. I'll look it up. Make you feel better. So uh, they've got time. I know that much right now. They do have time. So with the fact that they do have time, the question is, how do they handle it? And that's the key, isn't it? Isn't that the key to every great, good, mediocre, or amazing storyline that be begins? Is how is it handled? How is it handled in the long term? Because this company has a really, really nasty habit of screwing things up. Just when you think they can't on a few, just when you think, well, this thing is is written, pre-written for success, as as I believe this one is, by the way. Again, keep it simple, stupid. The KISS principle, you'll be fine, okay? But WWE tends to throw a whole bunch of eggs in the recipe when it only really called for two. And that's probably what we're talking about here. So, fingers crossed that they don't screw this up. So, if it's me, I keep this thing simple. You have Brock answer, and that's shot three being fired. Shot four needs to be a face-to-face confrontation in the ring, but no one touches anyone. I would even have Brock backpedal. Oh, Tom, you can't do that. Brock is the beast incarnate. He's the anomaly. He's the... He's the gargantuan. He's the juggernaut. He's the annihilator. He's the ender of worlds. <laughs> he's um, you know, he's he's Thanos and Galactus and the Beyonder all rolled into one. There's your comic book references for the day. You happy? I am. So he can't do that. Yes, he can, and he will because he's a heel. Bottom line, and heels at their core. Are cowards. That's another bottom line. And I don't care what heel we're talking about. From Ric Flair to, I don't know, to Ole Anderson to Baron Von Raschke to Rowdy Roddy Piper to, you know, Blackjack Mulligan to King Kong Bundy to Macho Man Randy Savage to CM Punk to Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. I backpedal with that one, didn't I? You get the point, right? To Seth Rollins, every heel at his core is a coward. And there are few exceptions to that. Animal and Hawk were not cowards, of course. The argument can be made that Brock is not a coward, but we've seen Brock backpedal against Big Show. We know he can. He's backpedaled against Undertaker before. Because heels will take the low road. Okay, if there's an easy way out, they'll get because that's what a heel is supposed to do. Period. You're crazy if you think otherwise. A heel's supposed to take the easy way out. Plain and simple. Okay, that's what he does. And because that's what he does, that means you can always count on the heel to deliver because the heel is always going to do whatever it takes to win, but he's also going to do whatever it takes to, to upset you, to let you down, to displease you, to make you want to kill him. <laughs> Because, that again, that's what he's best at, man. That's what he does better than anyone. That's what a heel is, okay? So, yes, Brock needs to backpedal to Goldberg. You better believe he does. He needs to. That's something that's got to happen. And I don't, I don't mean he has to do it to the point of it being laughable, but I think it needs to be obvious that while Brock is taking the low road, that 
you know, Goldberg is taking the high road. And that's what we're looking at right now. So with that being the case, the next shot fired should be after Brock answers the challenge, a face-to-face -face confrontation. Now WWE needs to stretch this out. They got to keep Goldberg's momentum going. They got to keep the heat against Brock going. They need to build heat against Brock. That's what they need to do, because again, real hard to out pop the beast, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's hard for anyone to heal him out, real hard. So if Bill has any prayer, has any chance of healing him out then something important has to happen. And I still think a lot of that importance is going to fall on the shoulders of his family. And you can debate that all day long about whether or not it's right or wrong that that were to happen. But I will tell you this right now. And this is something that we've discussed at length on the program before, in my opinion. There is no such thing as bad heat. I know that sounds crazy. Um, I know that sounds like it's impossible um, because, you know, in terms of, well, they shouldn't go there with a superstar's death. They shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that, this, that, and the other thing. But I still argue to my dying breath that there is no such thing as bad heat, that any heat you get is good heat because whether the crowd hates you because they're supposed to or they really hate you, if you're a heel, you're supposed to be hated regardless. So do what you do. Get out there and do what you do. You know, make it work. And that's what you have to do. And that's what Brock will do. Because Brock has to be Brock. And Brock is an uncaring, unmerciful, senseless uh, uh, animal that cannot be restrained. And he devours everyone and everything in sight. And he doesn't care about your physical well-being. He doesn't care how many people he hurt. He doesn't care that he ripped ripped Randy Orton's head open. He doesn't care that he ripped, ripped John Cena's head open in 2012. He doesn't care about any of that. The only thing he cares about is hurting people and getting paid to hurt people. That's what he cares about. Okay? And that's what needs to happen when he faces Goldberg. Now, um, um, apart from the booking, what happens at the end if these two do face each other at Survivor Series on November 20th? <laughs> Like I said, man, it's been a long night. I got the date. Relax. But what happens? Now, I have yet to read or notice any headlines or any columns so far about, here's who should win this match between Bill Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. And I haven't wrote it yet either. Stay tuned. Who was going to go over? Dude. Um, I, I'm one of the guys that believe Dean should have went over. Or should have done better than what he did. We all know that match with Dean and Brock was not fun to watch. Um, Dean should have had more of an impact. Especially for a guy that went on to become WWE World Champion later. But here's the thing. Brock is, is not in the business of giving the rub to younger talent. I mean, you could say that he did with all three members of the Shield. But no one pinned him. Right? And here's the thing with all of that. He doesn't have to put over younger guys. WB's made it very clear that's not what he's there for, which is a good thing because, number one, Goldberg's not young. Number two, supposedly this is his last match, what I which I would argue is not true. I think Goldberg will work Mania, and I think he'd be crazy not to. If the offer's right, the opponent's right, if I were him, I would definitely work Mania. But WB's track record, of treating former WCW stars the right way, and the, by right I mean good, <laughs> sensible, decent, is not very good at all. Um, see Sting, okay? Sting lost every match he worked. He didn't work many, but he lost them. And I got a real problem with that, okay? I've never been a WCW guy, but I was an NWA guy, and I still am. And I had a major problem with seeing Sting do the job every time he stepped in the ring. Now, Sting had some great moments. He did. The fact that he was at WrestleMania was a great moment as well. And a moment that, you know, he can tell his grandkids about. That his kids can be proud of. That he can be proud of. It was a good match. But a match that he ultimately lost. And the question I have for you is, who should win this match between Brock and Goldberg? Who should win this match? 
Because that's not been debated just yet. That's not been debated. It's going to be. It will be eventually. And I'll probably be one of the guys, again, that's going to be talking about it. But who should go over here? Because you you can make the argument for either guy. Okay? If this is really Goldberg's last match, if it is, and he rides off into the sunset again like he did last time, but this time he rides off like the hero, then what good came of him pinning Brock? Because he won't be around to get anything good from it. Brock, on the other hand, if he beats the guy that, that represented the only blemish on his record, then what's that say about Brock? That now Brock is 100% invincible. Then he can go on to the next guy. Because I'm going to tell you something right now, and I want you to hear this close. Be very, very close when you hear this, okay? Because this is very important right now. If Brock comes out of this thing 100% invincible, then when he does finally lose, the guy that pins him, and I'm talking about pin him, is going to get the the monster, I can't say it's enough, the monster push of a lifetime, man. I mean, huge, massive, massive, on a scale of which maybe we haven't seen in years push. Because all of that work that Brock did to become the ultimate monster will transfer the guy that pins his shoulders to the mat for one, two, three. I mean, that's it. Bottom line. It really is. And my my heart says that Goldberg needs to win this match. My head says Brock's going to win it. But the only reason to bring Bill back if Brock wins is to clean Brock's record of the blemish. And um, that's... I understand it, but that doesn't mean I necessarily agree with it at all. And, you know, you can look at that and you can say that, well, Tom doesn't get it. He, you know, WWE has invested all this time and money and effort into Brock Lesnar and he should be the unstoppable monster and yada, yada, yada. The reason we're in the position we're in right now, the reason he's in the position he's in right now to have to work Goldberg to begin with is because WWE's booked this guy to the moon and back. And, well, not even back, just to the moon. And it's it's insane. I don't know of the last talent that Vince Man has booked this much. I mean, this guy is, dude. He's like the one man army. He is like you. There's no touching him. And and I, I've I've written about this at length for like every website I contribute to, and I've said the same thing every time that WWE has themselves to blame for this. I mean, in every way, shape, and form. And maybe they don't see it as a problem, but from where I'm sitting, it's a problem. Because in the argument that I just made earlier about what good did anything come of Brock, you know, beating Goldberg when Goldberg comes back and has such a major impact, except to get Brock over, the same argument was had by CM Punk when he was told that Brock was going to pin him. Think about that. It's the same argument Punk had about every part-timer that pinned him. Brock, part-time, pinned him. Triple H, part-time. Pinned him. Was he even part time? Undertaker, part time. Pinned him. Rock, part time. Pinned him. Why? Why? What good came of any of that except to take CM Punk's star and dim it considerably? What good comes of doing this, of Goldberg doing the job to Brock except to shine Brock up like he's never been shined up before? This has got to be leading to a loss at the end. Has to be. One guy has to take this guy down. And when you find that guy, let me know. Because it ain't Roman. If it was Roman, he would have done already. And I get that WWE is trying to protect the, their investment with Brock. But they got a huge investment in Roman as well. And, you know, they should. Because Roman's going to be there forever. Don't you haters hate that? <laughs> Keep on hating. <laughs> you like the energi Energizer Bunny? Still hating. Oh my God, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, man, it's, you know, again, what what's going to happen here? I'll tell you right now, this thing's starting off the bang and I'm all for it. I love a good story. I'm a sucker for a good story. As a writer, as a fan, I'm a sucker for a good story, man. This has the makings to be one of the best stories we've seen in a long, long time. Hell in a Cell's got some great storytelling going into it. We're not going to lie about that. We're going to do a Hell in a Cell thing. Uh, at some point, but 
yeah, it's a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. But great storytelling with Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar. I love it. I, I love it. And I was one of the guys who wrote a, I wrote this column. Dude, don't quote me. It's it's October right now. I don't know when this column came out. I could look, I suppose. Um, it was written for Sports Kita, as a matter of fact. And it wasn't getting a lot of press at the time, but I wrote it because it was during the WWE 2K17 tour. And um, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, I, I, the comments on it weren't very favorable to the idea. But I'm like, you know what? This this has to happen. In fact, I wrote it in June. June 16th of this year, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg, the inevitable WWE return match with a question mark. Well, they don't call me the pro wrestling prognosticator for nothing. Okay, no one calls me that. I call myself that. It's kind of like everyone called Michael Jackson the king of pop when it was Michael Jackson's camp that proclaimed him to be the king of pop. He wanted to be called the king of pop from that point on. And because everyone's a sucker, they fell for it and said, oh, he's the king of pop. I love that word. What a great title. It's amazing. And now multiply X number of years later, we've all forgotten where it came from. I haven't forgotten. Sidebar. Sorry. Got carried away. But uh, Pro Wrestling Prognosticator lives and breathes, man. He's all up in your ear right now. Hey, what's up? So, uh, <laughs> I'm happy. I just, you know, I wish every pro wrestling feud started out with such a great bang as this one has. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I think this, I think the match itself is going to be better than what a lot of people maybe believe it will be. And I think that they're going to outdo WrestleMania 20 in which the, they kind of stuck up the place for a lot of different reasons that we've covered before. But I think that this is going to be much better. I think that, in my humble opinion, that Brock is going to give him the F5, and not only is Goldberg going to kick out, but he's going to start getting back up after it. Now, I'm not talking about Road Warrior Hawk springing back up after a pile driver. That's a bit much, in my opinion, even for Goldberg. But I think that if, when not if, but when Goldberg starts getting back up to one knee, and Brock turns around and has this look on his face like, "What do I have to do to get to, to beat this guy?" That's going to be an amazing moment in that match. And it's going to be one of those moments you're going to rewind and watch again. Like the moment when he and Taker set up and were laughing at each other and Taker mocked him. I think you'll, you'll rewind that moment with Goldberg and Brock. And I think it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the match. You should be too. So, uh, Hey, guess what, man? You're not going to guess. Maybe you will. We have reached the end of the hour. Isn't that something? By the way, this is, um, uh, there's no, there's nothing that says this has to be an hour. It's just kind of what I do. So I guess we could just keep talking, but at some point I have to sleep because you know, I'm old. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's me admitting defeat, I suppose. Or maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But listen, man, glad you came along from the ride. We got to do some business before we go off the air. This has been episode number 63, the return of Goldberg. I have been your host. The aforementioned Tom Clark. This is Tom Clark's main event. Thank you very much for listening. This production is part of a much bigger picture. Our production company, owned by myself and good friend Kyle Smith, is called Boink Studios. This has been a Boink Studios production. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to check us out online, please feel free to do so. You can check us out at tomclarkbr.wix.com slash boink. That's the Boink Studios website where we cover a lot of comic books, movies, TV properties. If you like to look and listen about uh, uh, stuff we've got on the world of professional wrestling, you're listening to a podcast right now. we got two more, Tom and Kyle's Comedy Action Hour and Tom Clark's 30-Minute Fun Show, both of which need new episodes. My apologies. We are a, a, a busy bunch of beavers, and I don't even know what that, but we're a busy bunch of guys. How's that? Is that better? But uh, all, all excuses, by the way. We could do so much better, and we offer our humble apologies. But yes, we do need to record new episodes for both of those shows. But listen, man, if you'll go to iTunes, Google Play, check them out. So we want you to. And we want you to download them. Choose whatever device you want. The programs are free. They'll cost you nothing. Okay? And we're very humbled that you download and subscribe. And we're very honored to bring you our stuff. Remember earlier I was talking about Batista being honored and humble in front of fans? Well, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, so, yes. If you will download, subscribe, that would be much appreciated. If you would like to look and read a lot of our stuff, you can check out the aforementioned Point Studios website. You can also check out my work on 
the Bleacher Report. Been there for six years, going strong, having a, um, having a great time. So feature columnist there for WWE. So much thanks to all you folks who read my columns. Much appreciated. You can also find me on Sports Kita, and as well as the the great Camel Clutch blog, which I need to deliver a piece to very, very soon. The highly acclaimed Camel Clutch blog. And uh, good good stuff over there on that site. And you can go check it out. I also run my own blog, TomClarkBR.Wix.com slash blog, where it's all exclusively pro wrestling material. If you would like to give us, uh, give, us a, give us a buzz, we do have some freelance work available. Kyle Smith, my partner in crime, does the artwork on the Boing Studios website. And on Tom and Kyle's Comedy Action Hour podcast, he does the artwork on that as well that you see on your phone every time you listen to an episode. He's an amazing artist, as you can see, a great illustrator. He's available for freelance work, as is the man that did the music on this show, as well as our other two shows, Philip Goose Fender. If you'd like to get some work from either of these fine gentlemen, please feel free to drop us a line, boingstudios at yahoo.com. Follow us on Twitter at Boing Studios. Check us out on our Facebook page as well. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, it's Tom Clark BR. That's my Twitter account, bro. Go check me out, follow me, and I will follow you back. I think we're done. Wasn't this fun? This was episode number 63, and I'm starting to rhyme. That's how you know you're getting tired. <laughs> what are you going to do? Listen, man, thanks so much for being with us. I do appreciate it, as always. Thanks for, for checking us out. Please come back the next time. Because we will be back next time with a brand new, all-exclusive, all-original content episode of Tom Clark's Main Event. So come back real soon. Check us out. Thanks again, man. We do appreciate it. And we will see you next time on Tom Clark's Main Event. <laughs>